Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Aaron. Uh, and this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Um, we have literally been from desert racing to overland. It's been a long time since we touched rally cars. We need to we need to mm -hmm. uh, readdress rally cars. I'm making a note. Rally cars. Well, I can. I'm going to talk to Roger Garbo and see if he wants to come on the show and talk about that uh, rallified before rs4 okay yeah i'm in that for for sure uh my my usual topic as always we're socially distanced we did it before it was mandated that's the only way a guy in connecticut and a guy in kansas city can have a podcast <laughs> together is to not dude can you imagine trying to travel to do this oh my god <laughs> you need that net jets account yeah exactly and uh th again this is one of our episodes where the the guest is actually closer to me so I don't think we've ever had a guest that was closer to me. Let the record show. We've had some East Coast guests, but they were like down at like I think yeah, they were like in Georgia. Yeah, they usually went off roads in the Carolinas of America. You know, Kansas City being the heart of America, it kind of makes it easy. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Connecticut's not really like, you know, ground zero for off roading. Unfortunately, <laughs> I guess I should point out that like every guest from the West Coast is still technically closer to me. <laughs> anyway, they're all closer to me. Anyway, uh, we we didn't get a lot of news in on the last time we recorded a show, um, which was the guy who would have talked about the news a lot, but David chose to just skip over all of it. So he does uh, that. And we had David job. Tracy on from Jalopnik, and uh, mm -hmm. no relation, by the way. And um, as far as you know, I will continue to point that out. I, I did check with my dad and he's like, yeah, I don't think we have in like if we're related, it's like sixth cousins. Like it's Doesn't not mean it's not possible. <laughs> if we're related, we are far distantly enough related that if we chose to become same sex marriage, it would be allowed in some states. OK, that took a turn. I, I yeah, just totally wasn't ready for it. Like it's the worst <laughs> comment ever. I, was I can't to see wait if to I tell him. <laughs> I can't wait to tell him you said that. Okay, moving on. I'm going the to kill news the show right now. Uh, <laughs> no, so um, Jeep 392 reviews are out. Uh, People have driven them. We haven't driven it. What's up, they, Jeep? Yeah, the uh, Camille was messaging us earlier, and he said the one that's in the New England press fleet is even like allocated to a certain few journalists, and nobody else gets to touch it. So. so not guest Camille didn't get it. Yes. Former guest William is on the list. Yes. William Bird in the DC area is on the list yes. for the East Coast 392, yep. which shows Camille needs to come on the show. Incidentally, William Bird, who sold his Jeep today. Yeah. <laughs> After he wrecked his Mustang and got After that total. Like, wrecked his Mustang, he sold his Jeep, and now. Yeah, we'll let him come back on the show and talk about his we, newest purchase. We shouldn't but. say he wrecked his Mustang. He someone crashed into him. So yeah, that's fair. <laughs> like, the implication yeah. with Mustangs is that usually it's the Mustang driver. Yeah. I know this joke is so played out. Well, anyway, William, moving on. William's um, a decent driver. He was under control. He got T mode. He so three ninety two reviews fault. are out. Emmy Hall loved it, is from what I saw. I have read very few bad words about it, and I am. I don't want to say less surprised that I read no bad words, but like everybody loves the JL. That's no secret, especially the Rubicon. The 392 does pretty well in all of the other vehicles that it's offered in, you know, uh, Challenger, Charger, SRT Jeep. What else? They had it in the uh, Chrysler 300 for a while. But it's been, it's been so, all over the place. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I think her know. review is the best. Well, it's it's the dumbest most fun thing. <laughs> That's all it needs to say, actually. No, like that can be the review. Like it's done. Yeah, no, so, three ninety two Jeep, very somebody, good, who, very dumb. Review over. Yeah, I was listening to somebody the other day, and they were talking about, um, like we're at peak dumb, like T Rex three ninety two Jeep, like oh, yeah. We're, we're at the end of the ICE, like the internal combustion engine is like, what else can you do to it? Like It's like the last hurrah. It's like, this is the crescendo at the end of the fireworks. <laughs> and, and basically FCA. 1812 overture is going, fuck you yeah. everywhere. <laughs> St Stellantis is just like, yeah, put another supercharger in it. Who cares? Yep. Like they're... Yep. 
the dumbest vehicles ever. I still want to drive it though. Oh, so bad. I, no, I, I just, I want to be the th- like fourth owner of one. I'm like, I'm already, <laughs> already there. Yeah. Like the, the only crappy part about that is like used Jeeps hold such good value. And you know, if it has that engine that it's going to get the crap beaten out of it. It's going to get the crap beaten out of it. And whoever has the beat the crap one is going to be like, no, 30. And you're like 15. <laughs> and they're going to be like 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah literally i know the, honestly the move in the jeep world right now is like the three six with a supercharger better Which, gas mileage better fuel economy and it's like five grand former uh guest of the show sean holman sean, just put a yeah. supercharger on his three six yep <laughs> that's the move so yeah. anyways so 392 obvious, reviews are out yeah. and it's dumb and great i'm assuming and I and don't quote me on this. Long Range America, uh, JL Unlimited, auxiliary gas tanks are going to be necessities. I would expect so. I, I think people are recording between twelve and fourteen miles per gallon. Aaron's got a Tacoma that'll do that. I say that's pretty good for a Tacoma. <laughs> I'll get a- yeah, my forerunners get thirteen eight. So yeah, so. so- uh, we also did not talk about the Subaru Outback. I'm speaking as I type. We can tell. <laughs> speaking in slow motion. Yeah, so Subaru Outback Wilderness, they pretty much told us what it was before they actually like did their big reveal. Um, the Outback has kind of been like the sleeper vehicle for people who want to go off tarmac but don't actually care about needing something with low range for a while because the ground clearance is kind of insane. There's like a really quiet aftermarket for via, you know, for skid plates and brush guards and that kind of crap. This so Subaru, it's got a skid plate. So Subaru <laughs> said, I'm going to cash in on the fun and brought out the Outback Wilderness. I wouldn't be surprised to see a cross trek wilderness sometime mm-hmm. in the near future. Um, also, uh, hey Subaru, if you put the STI engine in the cross trek wilderness, I would I would buy one. So yeah, I mean, we don't need to spend much time on this because it's It's, not so much in the vein of what we do or talk about, Well, but it's everything mechanically the same, right? Just a little more lift, a little lift and um, Yokohama all terrains. I don't know what you want to call mechanical or not tires and wheels. I don't Uh, count those as mechanical. Okay, so then yes, mechanically the same. Um, uh, the what what I'm reading is it's got nine and a half inches of ground clearance, which is actually really strong for a you know something that most people wouldn't even bat an eye at. Isn't that a stock JK? Uh, I think a JK Sport, unlike the dinky 17s, okay. thereabouts. Still, but, it's the same. Super gets a quote. Yeah, same ground clearance as a Wrangler. <laughs> and in all fair, like there's nothing in the, you know, lower New York or Connecticut area that you could even need that for. So for at least here, and I know for a lot of the people in Colorado and in like the Northwest, it's the perfect vehicle for everything that doesn't require low range because it's comfortable. It gets better gas mileage than a forerunner. Um, It's got more space and it's going to be a better place to spend time. And I mean, honestly, I, I kind of dig it. I've kind of always been into the Outbacks, um, but, you know, it is it is what it is. It's not going to run the Rubicon Trail anytime soon, but it's got a, a roof rack that is weight and load rated for rooftop tent. Uh, it's got a full-size spare. I mean, Subaru, like, kind of did their homework. They didn't just go, like, here's a little bit of extra plastic and ship so- it. Russ, the last time we talked roof racks was with Robbie and I think Joel. It was that massive mashup show where you and and Spen left. Um, yes, I don't think was a factor. I don't think you were here when we talked about the integrated roof rack of Subaru. I don't think so. No, so I, I think the, we the have... side rails are yeah. actually the crossbars. Oh yeah, they like fold out. Yeah, they just fold yeah, across. Brilliant. Like, it blew my mind. I never knew that. It's absolutely brilliant. Robbie said that. And I was like, no, it's dude, not. that's not real. I hope for Subaru's sake, they have like a patent or something on that because that is, I mean, that that's a game, you know, 
my forerunner, I can hear the wind going over the roof <laughs> only because of those crossbars. You know, yeah. it was your which, truck. <laughs> which are in the place where it says on it, literally put the crossbar here yeah, to reduce there's like wind noise a fucking like index card size sticker <laughs> on the on the side rails that the says this is the best place for the crossbars to be so yeah and even so but something that just clicks in clicks out is like a I, modular type thing is brilliant i, I mean super real guys i mean the, the best part about this thing and i I'm not a huge like Subaru fan at all, but the best part about the Outback, spe specifically this new one, is that 99% of the population that is doing overlanding or car camping, this is going to fit the bill for them. Yeah. And really, I mean, that's the prop. I mean, it's not really a problem, but it's kind of the, uh, it perpetuates itself, I guess, is that we all feel like we need to up our game in the next type of vehicle or lift it higher or, you know, bigger time. And at the end of the day, most people get away with a lot of stock stuff. I mean, when you're out in Colorado and you're being passed by a minivan on, you know, a trail <laughs> to really yeah. make you question, why did I invest so much in this vehicle? You know, when I could uh, have just it, rented the minivan. Yeah. I mean, in the Outback, like you said, it's going to have great opportunity for people to get out and do what they want to do. Uh, I think sometimes we just get, we get kind of the, uh, we get washed over by the beauty of all these awesome vehicles with all the extra stuff. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of got its own glamor to it, you know, you add a little piece here and there and it makes it your own. But I think honestly, I think this, I hate to say it, but the bean out back, because I like to look at it right now, like how it's like a little bean. I mean, yeah. it's got a, a good opportunity here. to really Yeah. And the thing is this, the Outback wilderness kind of draws the line between people who are in it for the vehicle aspect of it and the people that are in it to get outdoors right you know yeah. subaru's big mojo is helping you explore helping you get out there yada 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 reality is if you want to do anything more vehicle oriented that actually requires some semblance of involvement with the vehicle you need more you know something more than this so this is like that there's that Venn diagram where it overlaps and it's, it, this is that little overlap. They're going to sell every single one of these fucking things. And it is brilliant. It, it's weird that my, my only takeaway from it is like the over fenders are a little too much over for me. Whoever is drawing the over fenders at Saru. <laughs> like I, can you come on the show so we can have a conversation about yeah, like, like, like what I want to discuss kindergarten and coloring inside the lines. <laughs> Like what type of aero advantage do these little canards give you? Like, it's just. <sighs> I can't wait for like some after like rock blocks or rally armor or somebody to come out with like <laughs> the fucking add ons that fill in the gaps to round it out. I just want to know the purpose. Um, like visually it. I wonder if there's something on the sidelines, like if you look at it from the face on or from the rear, if it's somehow, it's kind of like a brush guard to keep, you know, stuff mm. from up against the body of the, the vehicle or something. Maybe. That's actually, maybe. yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, solid maybe they're point. dubious enough they've already considered that and they're like, aha, you, you goofs, you didn't realize <laughs> part of something. See? I don't but know. The but closest I can get is a front three quarter. Oh, it's tiny. Come on. They're going to, they're going to, you know, they brought that X mode thing to all of their vehicles short of like the BRZ and the WRX. They're going to bring this to everything else. So uh, Every, it's good. are going to have a wilderness version. Like it's going to become a trim level basically. Yeah. I mean, it's like Trailhawk. There's a Trailhawk, everything except Wrangler, you know? So I think Aaron's right. Cause I found a head on shot and look at how much that head on apply fender. directly to the forehead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look how yeah, much that over really fender protect. pops out, though. Yeah, it's going to protect the body from any kind of like scrapes and stuff like that, potentially. I mean, I don't know what kind of trails I'd be taking this on that I would need to worry about that. But yeah, obviously, they're trying to show that, hey, look, you can put this in some pretty interesting off camber and rocky positions. A couple of photos you've shown, it's got, like you said, nine inches of clearance, which is pretty good. Nine and a half. It's like, oh, I apologize. Yeah, I don't want to miss out. <laughs> you never forget it. that extra half inch. There's there's a Subaru <laughs> PR person somewhere yelling at you over that half inch. Like, <laughs> you guys have no idea how much uh, time and effort we put into this stuff. Speaking of time and effort, 
the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which they've been teasing for the better part of uh, 10 years. <laughs> so I, Jeff, our editor at Hooniverse saw it in person. Yes. And the only there. question I asked was, does it have the extended bed thing like the concept did? And he said, no. And I was disappointed because that was the best part. It was, but that would have been truck. such a huge increase in yeah. like the added marginal cost for you know something that would have sold no extra vehicles. I just called it a truck. It's definitely not a truck. It's not a truck. It's, it's a, a car uh, with a bed. It's a, a yeah. It's a, eh, it's not really a Ute per se because then you would call the Ridgeline a Ute, which we're not. I would again uh, apply that to it's a four. They're four door Utes. Like they're just cars with beds. So We're gonna have to get Joel on the show to clarify. I'm sure um, he's asleep by now. Probably. Actually, he's that's probably not getting true. ready to we, wake up. This is our normal recording time, and that's like one o'clock in the afternoon for him. Yeah. So he's <laughs> wide awake right now. <laughs> Joel's in Australia, Aaron. In case that yeah. wasn't clear. <laughs> um, I like these. Uh, look at these lights on the like, fender wells. That's nice. So I mean, that's a nice touch. That helps with the uh, rest of the aesthetics. Yeah. The, yeah, the front end of the Santa Cruz looks like absolutely nothing else. And obviously it's the same as the front end of the, I guess, Santa Fe. I can't keep track of Hyundai's it, crossovers anymore. It is Santa Fe. It is Santa the, Fe, okay. I, I do know that they the, both the Santa Fe and Santa Cruz are from the same plant. Okay, um, that makes sense. It, the front end of this truck kind of looks like what I would have expected a cyber truck to actually look like, as opposed to like the weird... <laughs> Mm -hmm. geometric structure they went like that's a really futuristic looking front end it's like they took the lexus you know predator <laughs> maw and actually brought it you know got rid of the traditional headlight treatment and, and i mean headlights integrated into the grill works way better on this than it really should are those the headlights though i don't I, I'm I'm not sure. It could be the headlights, <laughs> the fog lights, and the also. Well, no, because there's also fog lights on the side. I don't know. I think the front end looks amazing. I, I think, think it looks good. They missed out on a few opportunities in regards to what they probably could have done for like trick packaging. You know, the first of these, the groundbreaker all, of all of these, not car-based pickups, but like untraditional pickups, was the Avalanche. And yep. the Avalanche had the Midgate, which was like revolutionary, you know, not that it's made its way into anything recently, but the back folded down so you could get full eight foot boards in there. Um, and it had those side pockets and it had the steps in the back. And, and you know, this has like the trunk cooler box thing, which is great. Like a Ridgeline. Uh, like a Ridgeline. But the Ridgeline's tailgate also swings both ways, which is pretty amazing too. Um, so I don't know. I'm glad to see something. So does Dodge or Graham. So does Dodge. Well, Dodge is, <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Dodge just does like a thousand things, but yeah. I don't know. I'm happy to see this finally coming to fruition. I look forward to the Ford Maverick or whatever they're calling it. Yep, Maverick. That's going to compete with it. Um, I did see I think some it, people give Hyundai some crap. They were like, you can't even fit a mountain bike in it. Yeah, but, but for that matter, Ford's running around telling everybody you can fit a mountain bike in the back of the Bronco, and you can't with the back seats up, and you can't if it's a full-size mountain bike. Are you talking about the Bronco Sport? Dude, the Bronco Sport, sorry. Got to really clarify, got to clarify. Look at that. It, it's just fine. Well, and like, how many full-size pickup guys have you seen with the same thing across the tailgate and the bike's the exact same way? Most of them. Yeah, like I, there's like two in my neighborhood that are consistently with their <laughs> mountain bikes hanging over the tailgate. Like, yes, you couldn't fit multiple ones in this truck, but like, I called it a truck. Uh, you, I like it. I think it's a good idea. I bet they sell a bunch of them. I'm producing it weirdness. Steps I, I want more side. weird. Yeah, it's, it's not traditional which is going to scare off 90% of the people, but the people that the people that buy Ridgelines, it's the perfect vehicle for them. You know, yeah. they need a truck. They don't need to tow 10,000 pounds or they don't need to pretend they're going to tow 10,000 pounds. Like exactly. 
was that i think that might have actually been you that said it's more like kind of akin to like the baja where it's you know it's like a subaru baja like it's not you're not really going to use it for truck stuff like it's just baja wilderness would have been perfect there we go (laughs) give them time man bajas are expensive like they're that's like another cult vehicle you're like, hey, can I get a look at that? And they're like, yeah, for 10 grand. And you're like, oh, 15 grand out here for a good like XT with a stick. $3,500 car, man. Calm down. Yeah, right. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Uh, car news. You have car news of your own. Yeah, I do. I don't know why I sound <laughs> depressed sound, about no, it. Don't, don't sound depressed. We do um, that. But- um, Aaron, just to fill you in. So Chris has, over the last year, gone through a lot of vehicular changes. So first he sold his V8 Forerunner to me. Then he sold his Land Cruiser. Then he bought a Sequoia. Yep. And now. And and now we still have a Sequoia. But we also have a 2017 Chevy Suburban. Yeah, look at that. So. That's me clapping. It, it cracks me up. Like, first of all, I thought the wheels were 20s. They're actually 22s. And oh my God. that's an issue. The problem, though, is they put brand new Michelins on those 22s. So they're there for the next like 80,000 miles. Or just sell them as a package. Yeah, that's always the best. That's probably like two grand worth of wheels. Oh, that's more than It's a lot. Like, what is the smallest wheel you can fit over those brakes? uh, I think an 18. That's still. Yeah, I think it's a, a Chevy 18. My my favorite part was oh, am I going the right? Nope, that's a that's a Dynan E forty E thirty six. Um, this is our garage now. Jesus like, Christ, man! It's so full of car. Also, there's no way to buy a suburban unless it's white. <laughs> I mean, beg to differ, dude. Not not so. You and I had this as a text conversation. We haven't talked about it on the show, but like, n- there are no new cars coming right now. Like there's a supply issue, microchip, microchip shortage because of China and Suez Canal. Yes, there. I think there was a fire at the factory in China. Is the the brief information? There were COVID delays. Then there was a fire at one of the major plants, (laughs) and then the stuff that wasn't involved in that fire was in the canal and has been delayed. So that's my understanding. So. You, you can't get a new vehicle, right? Well, you, you can get a new vehicle right now, but like there's not a lot of more inventory coming right now because no one is then moving that limited new inventory. There means mm-hmm. there's no used inventory coming in. It in turn brings up the prices of everything on the used market. So used is static, new is static. So when I started searching for Suburbans, there were like four <laughs> within a reasonable day's drive. Um, also being during COVID, we didn't want to drive all over the Midwest, just going to get the perfect one. Um, so, and of those four, only there were two that had the second row captain's chairs, which we desired. Um, and this one was the newest one. It had more miles, but it was newer. How many miles are on it? Uh, 130. And I, I never do this. Never do this. I sprang for the warranty. Ooh. Probably a good call. Peace of mind is everything. So today I took the kids a run an errand after dinner. And as I'm leaving our street, I hit the right turn signal and it blinked twice at the normal rate and then went super fast. And as anyone with any electrical or automotive experience understands is that there's not enough resistance in the circuit. Something's out. And I got a little prompt that said uh, right rear turn indicator out. Those are LED based. Oh boy. So you have to replace the whole thing. I don't know, but I'm taking it right back. <laughs> like <laughs> generally, I mean I won't least... name I won't name drop the dealer until I see how this goes. But <laughs> I'm no longer with Volvo, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> exactly. You could can... yeah. um, within it... within like and also like the night I was t- bringing it home, it did that and I was like, I need to figure that out. And, uh, but I didn't get the indicator prompt on the dash or I was too tired and trying to pay attention to the road at the time. Um, it doesn't have a heads up display. 
Oh, really? Yeah, it's got this little, and it's, to be honest, it's very clear, and you can brighten and dim it based on night and day. Like, I can't wait to pay for the cost of changing that bulb and that tiny little projector when it goes out. It's about still under 85 cents and then 10 hours of labor to take exactly. the dashboard apart. Actually, no, most, some of those actually, the unit that sits up top to do the projection, you can pry out with one of the interior trim removal tools Okay. and everything's, I mean, you have to, you know, be like a contortionist and reach over the steering yeah, wheel. I'm trying to imagine everything. my six foot four frame getting to that. It's going to be one of these, like down the windshield, this one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just lying across the windshield. <laughs> so yeah, we got, a, we got a Suburban. Congratulations. Congratulations. The, the kids thinks it hilarious because it's like a two DVD. Like it's the newest thing we've ever purchased car wise. Like, <laughs> We've never had anything newer than a 2013. And so this thing has two DVD screens. It's got Wi-Fi, which I think I have to pay for. You you will. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the kids think it's hilarious. So because then now now in their minds they're like, I can watch the movie or my device. I'm like, no, that's not why we got this. <laughs> that's because they like to party. That's why. Exactly. <laughs> Something like that. It's a hot rod reference right there. <laughs> that's right. Uh, uh, God, and I like to party. Yeah, you have not talked about off-roading in Colorado on the show. Um, I think I think we'll save it for <laughs> for next week. Teaser, teaser. Yes, off-roading in Colorado. Spoiler alert. I can't remember who our next it's, guest. It's is. the best. It's Manuel Correa. Okay, so yeah, that'll be fun. He'll enjoy it. Yeah. Um, that's it. I need five seconds. My heat is still on full blast and it's not turning off. So bear with me for a second. <laughs> well, we're going to get into Aaron. So for the audio uh, listener, nothing will happen. The video listener will just see Ross disappear for a little bit. So Aaron is the owner. Yep. Yep. Of Switchback Outdoor Safety. Uh, my favorite part is I've seen your posts on Facebook quite a bit. Oh, good. That's yeah, good. Thing. I, I was worried. place. I, I keep putting them up. I'm not sure if anyone paying attention, you know. It's a glory of social media. Like it's just shouting into the void, much like running a podcast feels like. <laughs> it feels probably much the same. You're know, just yeah. yelling out like somebody's listening. Like I, I do have analytics. I do know that people are listening. But it, it's really just like throwing a ball into the abyss and hoping for the best. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, Facebook tells me people are looking at what I'm, I'm putting out there. I just don't know if that's true or not. I'm not sure sure that they're giving me the same thing <laughs> they are when they when they hear me talking about vacuums and they give me an advertisement for vacuums. I don't exactly. think they're giving me edge, Maybe. you know, for my stuff, you know. Yeah. My favorite part is when we discuss something in the house and all of a sudden I have ads served to me. Dude, yeah. I'm working from home now. Sam and I have been talking about buying a, like a desk for like this weird little corner so I have a place to work. Guess what every single platform is advertising right now? <laughs> That's I, it, so yeah, weird. like it's creepy as hell. Anyways. So Aaron, what got you into off-roading camping? Uh well, I've been camping since I was a kid. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Illinois, and uh, you know, I grew up on a farm and I would just take my little tent and go out and sleep in the back 40, you know, me and my dog. <laughs> It was, uh, you know, just me in the sky, and it, it was something that was kind of special, and I enjoyed it, and I uh, got to college and started backpacking a little bit, and then got out and did a bunch of 14-years with some friends, and um, yeah, there was a post we threw up not too long ago. That is that is actually the one of the first MSR Hubba Hubbies, and I had to replace that rain fly after that trip. It is uh, It got tacky, and oh, really? uh, I, yeah, I nearly cried. <laughs> and so I found art and they're like, oh no, it's all good. We still make this tent and we still can help you with the rain fly. And apparently there was a, it wasn't a recall, but they, they knew there was something in the material and I got a new rain fly for shipping, I think is what I paid. It was awesome. So nice. it's fine. probably once people I'm telling you, it's, it's a huge deal. Where was uh, that picture taken? Because that lake, was that like a glacial lake? The color of that was crazy. That is in Arkansas. That's a river. Arkansas? Yeah, Ar uh, Arkansas is a weird place. Arkansas, you uh, well, out in Connecticut, it's hard to get down here, I'm sure, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, a little it, bit. beautiful place, you know. That's oh, holy shit, I never would have guessed that. Yeah, Ar this, Arkansas was our uh, our COVID vacation last year. 
we yeah. were like as as everything shut down we were supposed to go to colorado so we didn't go to colorado and we were like just go to beaver lake for a week mm. we mm-hmm. just rented a cabin and i like arkansas is great it's weird yeah it's, it's great we'll have to get you down there ross it's a lot of fun i'd love to check it out bring the yeah. forerunner yeah <laughs> bring the forerunner yep all, all v8 it'd be awesome better yet yeah. bring the miata ah <laughs> Well, anyway, yeah, that's a sure. long drive in that car. Yeah, it is. So as far as the off-roading, I, I kind of got into that when I was in college too. So I have Mazda B3000, which if you remember the Mazda B3000 for a while was really just a rebranded Ford Ranger. Yeah. And I had in one. And uh, man, we would go ripping around in Iowa on the back roads in that all the time. And I had a friend actually that had a uh, Subaru Outback. It was all white. Nate Wood, shout out to you. <laughs> and he was a trooper that he had that had the barn doors on it. And that was a really cool vehicle. And we used to take those and just run all over. So I got kind of involved doing that a lot more. And then after I got out, I started doing law enforcement in 05. And I did law enforcement up until 2017. Um, and throughout that time, I was you know camping, hiking, off-roading, uh, doing stuff. That is basically what it looked like. It had <laughs> two jump seats in the back. Uh, that were like the uh, little rocket ship seats that you folded down yeah. that were ways. Yeah. A little, little child could sit in there, but we'd cram people in there all the time in college. So it was a lot of fun. I, similar <laughs> age, do. I have ridden in one of those four jump seats before. That's in awesome. So anyway, like, I, I don't know, like, do. like 2009 or 10, I started doing more of like car camping. And then, you know, I guess I was interested in world expedition travel. And it had this kind of a allure to it where I was like, I wish I could do that. You know, you had all these great photos of people traveling in Land Rover discoveries and the Defenders and, uh, you know, Land Cruisers. And it was just something that was a far flung fetched idea that I was like, I really liked the idea of this. And I don't know, I just, it, it really captivated my adventurous spirit in some capacity. And then, you know, I got, um, I had a forerunner and built it up. And then I got an 80 series. I've had an FJ. I've had a Tundra. <laughs> um, we're now so into- what manufacturer do you like? Well, you know, I'm not particular. Um, <laughs> I start with T and end with Yoda. So those have been my favorite. <laughs> yeah, so. starts with Toyota and rhymes with Toyota. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I there's a lot of, uh, I you know, I, it seems like I'm kind of a purist, but <laughs> in that regard, but. You know, the, the thing is, I what I've has captured me about Toyota is, and a lot of people always rag on Toyota because they're slow to, to create new. I mean, the mm-hmm. Forerunner is as long in the tooth as anybody could get. I mean, at this point, the Tundra is even beating it and how long it's been out. Uh, so the thing I like about it is it's tried and true. And I, although you'll eventually have either your frame rust out from underneath you, but they'll use <laughs> replace for warranty, you know? Um, yeah, on a Tacoma, at least. end up leaking a valve leak, and then they're just trying to keep the frame from le- you know rusting out from underneath you. So it's just uh, frame corrosion protecting it. But I really have enjoyed them because I've had better, um, better luck with them in some capacity. I've had less issues, and uh, once you kind of get into a, a brand, you you understand how all the off you know the four by four systems work more consistently the same. Uh, you understand, you know, what, what their, what their capacities are. You understand how they're rated different, you know, the same, but that's not the same. I mean, I tell you what, the, the trucks that have caught my attention in the last year have been the gladiator when it came out. I really love, love that. It had better approach departure angles, had a lot better tow capacity, haul capacity, uh, than the Tacoma. So in the mid range, that truck, that truck was awesome. Um, and then it practically, you just take a Rubicon and you throw all the parts onto the Gladiator ready to go. I mean, it really kind of, they did a really good job by kind of allowing it to marry across its other platforms. But I really like the new Ford Bronco too. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great, great platform. I, and that is you could do big tires on those without really doing a lift on them. Um, and I, those, I think the big tires is almost a necessity. Yeah, but when they come from the factory and they got those little bitty things, it's yeah. the most goofy looking truck I've ever seen. You might as well make it a Ridgeline. Sorry, Ridgeline lovers. But, um, hey, the Ridgeline is very capable. It is, yes, it beats out Tacoma. Or a pilot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, look and, at that. And these aren't, these aren't small, but to me, no. they're 
too small. Well, you know, it's funny because the midsize truck market has become really a full size truck market from 15 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, oh, everyone, 100%. how small they are, you know, and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because you look at a Tundra, like a second gen or first gen Tundra, and you're like, wow, that truck is practically the same size as my third gen Tacoma. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, and that's where I look. A lot of people are like, oh, you should get a new vehicle. And I'm like, well, if you've seen a first or second gen Tundra, we can get a V8 and it's the same size as this third gen Tacoma. And, <laughs> you know, it's kind of got to say, how much technology do you want on it? And there's yeah. some benefits on the older vehicles, I think. But, but anyway, my I, brother has a Ram Rebel and it's bigger than anything from the 90s. What was it now? He has a Ram Rebel, okay, like a 1500, yeah. and it, it's enormous. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's crazy. Well, I mean, like you kind of asked like, what was kind of the next thing. I mean, the off-roading. I think that when I started building those other trucks, you know, the 80, the, the, the forerunner, the FJ, the Tacoma, you know, it just kind of kept progressing, you know, as just, and it wasn't, uh, you know, I was building it as I needed it. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just going to go and outfit something. But it was one of those that kind of gradually grew, you know, you start off, yeah, there's, that's my truck in one of the many progressions there. Uh, those that can't see it, it's uh, 2017 Tacoma. Uh, in this photo, it's got the Airby bumper with an AT overland habitat. And I think at that time I had a Princey rack, CBI rails and a CBI rear uh, swing out bumper. What was the suspension at that point? Uh, that one, that was post Icon. Uh, okay. That is to an OME, Old Man EMU. And, um, and at that point, I don't think I had airbags in it. Okay. So, hmm. but you know, I kind of just, it kept growing, you know, the original truck, I bought it brand new and that's after I had the 80 series We're in the mountains, my wife and I, and, um, the alternator went out and my wife is like, okay, you know, of course we made it back to town, you know, on one of the batteries, um, we had, you know, we had the old Ultima our Optima yellow tops at the time, you know, mm -hmm. I run Odyssey now and I would not say anything bad about Optima because it got me back to town and got there and went to two different stores. And I was like, I need an alternator for 97 <laughs> LX 450. Like, yeah. That's like going to be tomorrow. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm sleeping in a parking lot. So mm -hmm. we pour the alternator out that night. And then I had the new one in by seven or eight o'clock in the morning walked in with my core charge, took my other one, had it in in less than 30 or 40 minutes. <laughs> and then met my buddies up at the, uh, uh, at the neck, I think it was Black, Black Canyon, I think it was in Colorado. So it was a pretty fun little adventure there. But, you know, once we got the Tacoma, it was, a, you know, we had an idea where we we're headed with it because we were driving back from that trip and my wife's like, I'd really like us to get a newer vehicle. <laughs> She's <laughs> like, I really have this fear that something's going to break down and you know, for me, I was like, well, that's not really, I don't really worry myself with that. Things break, you know, and especially when you, you use them as I think they're designed to be used, you will apparently occasionally have a repair that's necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, we kind of was talking like, what do we, what would we build or how would we build it? And the truck platform to me just made more sense. You know, I could, I could do multiple things with it over time and it could continue to evolve or change as we needed it. And, it. and really we started out with a cap and, um, and then kind of added the sliders. And uh, I don't even think we had a rear bumper for some time that was an aftermarket. Um, and then we had an SOS or yeah, an SS uh, Southern style off-road slimline bumper on it for a long time. They make nice uh, stuff. What's that? They make nice stuff. Yes, they do. Uh, it was a great bumper. And I wouldn't have got rid of it, except I was in the Ozarks one year, and I crumped up the front of my passenger side uh, <laughs> uh, on a stump. And uh, I came back, and I realized I could basically, for the same cost of repairing all the factory stuff, I was going to have to cut up to put the SSO back on, mm. basically just put a new full-size front bumper on it. And you know, the SSO was great, but I didn't really care for the inability to access the winch. You know, a yeah. lot of off-road bumpers these days, they try to hide the winch so much. And I kind of come from a school of thought of you really want to access that winch as much as you can. And that was the biggest complaint I had about bumper. I mean, the truck was really good with it. Mm -hmm. You had to really pop the hood, go all the way in through 
behind the radiators. Yeah, that's they were doing stuff, and I was like, this isn't really conducive. And then about a year later, they finally cut these access holes in the bumper where you could get in there, and all you could really do was access the clutch. I mean, you couldn't really okay. It. Yeah, you so could, you can like freewheel it, and, right, and you that's couldn't it. Do it with it. And to me, that really wasn't where I wanted to be. So um, then we just kind of kept growing it, and it ended up with a habitat for a while, and then. Uh, now we're back to an RSI smart cap and, you know, I've put front runner racks across the top now. Um, and then uh, we have an Opus, which uh, I think Chris is interested in. So I'm going to have to he's, have he's mentioned it. Well, <laughs> I'm so can... curious. I need, I need to swing by. Uh, I think Adventure Motors has one in their like showroom, yeah. don't they? Yeah. Come by my house. I'll pop it open for you. Okay. It takes 15 minutes at most. So. Yeah. It's like, 90 seconds to set up yeah i mean for me i gotta get on the garage though so i mean I'm, i gotta add another five or seven minutes i mean <laughs> <laughs> not a was, deal breaker no not so much no. i was hoping uh adventure motors had one on their site because they re i remember they referenced them forever ago well they just had like uh, about six or seven of them i think in inventory come in and then they sold several of them within a couple of days so Here's, here's one of the setups, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was at, uh, that is at Moore Expo, I think. Is I was, it? I think so. That's down in the, yeah. Yeah. So, or no, that's not Moore Expo. I'm sorry. That is Rondi the Ozarks. Oh, okay. We were just to the right of that picture. <laughs> so this, this other one back here. <laughs> you actually, if you can see the habit, that's me. <laughs> so it's just that. <laughs> That's uh, my truck. So, uh, so curious on those. <laughs> You've mentioned yeah, that. I've we'll just it. spent so much money on a truck, though. <laughs> well, now you gotta be have all. I mean, you gotta be able to camp out of this. See, so you don't have to have a rooftop tent. You can yeah. just camp out of the trailer. The the funny thing about the the suburban is the towing rating on it is not good. What is it like? Seventy two hundred pounds. Six what why what the fuck is that about is it like does it just not have a trans cooler or so, something uh when you because of the trim line we got so it's the magnetic ride suspension the towing capacity is Ew. 6 to 6300 wow but that's really low the sequoia is still here and that's like nine grand so yeah. It's weird how that stuff works. I had a 2005 Avalanche and a 2004 Tahoe. And which do you think had the higher tow rating? The Tahoe. By like 1,500 pounds. <laughs> they were both Z71 trims, same rear end, and the Tahoe for whatever reason. So, yeah, no, it's, it's weird. So, what you're alluding to is you're going to ditch Magna Ride and get like no, <laughs> no. <laughs> that, yeah the the suburban is the in-town bus it's not being elevated to any kind of duty whatsoever like there's a reason like i i was okay with the bigger wheels i was like as long as like my favorite part of this was i was i was assuming the sequoia would go away the suburban would replace the sequoia and my wife was like nope it's like I love you. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys made that decision so quick. Uh, she once once she makes a decision. Yeah. So. So. And in fun news, I'm also daily in the suburban. <laughs> Her choice. I couldn't be daily. I, there are very few vehicles that could be more of an opposite for me to be daily in. And a, a, a white Miata is pretty much there. <laughs> you, I'm as big as I can get and you're as small as you can get. <laughs> it, could be, it could be like an NA Miata. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Aaron, where do you want to go yeah. with Switchback here? Uh, where do I want to go with it tonight or just in on life? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we where can ask the big it? questions yeah. if you so, want. Yeah, like, I mean, so for the listeners who don't know what switchback is, why don't you tell us how it came to be, where it's going, what it is, sure. what you guys do. Uh, so switchback outdoor safety started really as kind of the information <laughs> article website. And if you go to the website, switchbacksafety.com, there's my plug. Uh, and you look, 
there was about three months where I wrote and wrote and wrote, and I put out article after article. And the idea was so that I could, I could get information to people because I just felt like there wasn't a lot of good information about safety, uh, traveling, and uh, just trying to get people some information as far as how to do outdoors in a fun and responsible way so that nobody got hurt. Um, you know, a lot of the things we do outside is inherently dangerous, you know. Um, you know, whether you're into firearms and hunting or skiing, I mean, these all things have inherent risk, <laughs> and, you know, and then overlanding in itself, or, you know, and off-roading, you know, if you get out there uh, and, you know, you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you can get seriously hurt or killed, uh, or you could seriously hurt or kill someone you love or someone that you, you know, maybe you don't like them at all. <laughs> it's, uh, but the reality is, is you, you, I don't want people, you know, doing something and not knowing at least the inherent risk that's out there. I see sometimes if you take away the mysticism of what the hazard is and then provide some education in it, uh, people will choose to sometimes educate themselves and then make better choices and take care of those they care about. So, you know, and then um, it got to be a weird, you know, trans transformation. Someone's like, hey, I, I really like your articles of what you're, you know, what you're saying, but if I wanted a trauma kit, what would I do? Like, who, who do I buy? What do I buy? I'm like, I don't buy anybody. I, you know, here's what Piece I do. Together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, you know, I kind of was like, well, I'm not really sure what that, what to tell you, you know, I said, here's what I do. And, and then they're like, okay, well, why do you do that? You know, and, you know, it really kind of started with this idea of, this chest kit and this is a hill people gear heavy recon kit bag um it comes without this on here or this fancy knife and it just sits right here you know you can actually see i've got one here and then i got another one that's right here this is, for, this is a ladies one uh it's a little smaller uh i use those for running uh yes i do run it uh <laughs> But uh, least you know, the, fun the, thing. yes, the least fun things I do. But the reason I wanted something in this space is I did 10 years of tackle operations and law enforcement. So I was doing SWAT, eight of that as a sniper, and I was also an instructor for Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa. And this location was always out of my workspace, and everything was exactly where I wanted it. And I didn't need to put it down. You know, a lot of times if you have you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you should have a couple tourniquets in your car. You know, these are really good, right? These help you if you get uh, from all bleeding or uh, you end up lacerating an artery in your arm. What good does this do for you if it's in your car? <laughs> Fair point. And that's the biggest frustration I have is we keep encouraging people to do things and spend money. And we perpetuate this idea that if you have something, it will help you. I can right. put this in a backpack and it does no good for me. Um, yeah. I have bear mace. And if I put it in my backpack and my backpack is way over there while I'm in standing in the river and the bear comes up to me, <laughs> what good did it do for me? Exactly. So, you know, a lot of our stuff came from being principally based from a lot of our cyber training is that, look, we want it with us all the time. because It's not with me. It doesn't mean it doesn't do me any good. And uh, so we went with Hill People Gear and we called them and said, hey, look, we like your product. The fact that it's made in the United States, it's made in Missouri. Uh, it's made in St. Louis by a company called First Beer. Hill People Gear in Colorado, they design these. And so it's American made. And I was like, this is what I want. I want to take this product that I've been using for a long time and I want to sell it with our own trauma kits in it. Hey, that's a good photo. Yeah. <laughs> no, you bring up a really good point because everybody is all like, I think it would be different without Instagram and Facebook and all social media, but everybody is about having everything and not necessarily using it or knowing how to use it. So what you're saying is a, a very, very, very good point. I appreciate that. You know, it, it's not something I take lightly. Uh, if you look at that photo and those that are listening and not watching, you know, the kit opens up, it kind of folds out, and um, 
and in it, we try to keep some basic uh, require, you know, things that we think are really important, you know, um, pair of gloves, trauma shears to get clothing off people, um, chest seals. Um, we could talk about those here more in a minute. <laughs> uh, we've just went to um, a new product. Uh, we actually are redeveloping the, so our, our kits right now are made and by North, North American Rescue, one of the largest ones. Um, we give you the option to purchase it with a Cat 9 tourniquet or uh, you can get it with the soft tea tourniquet. Well, uh, Tac Metal Solutions, who makes the soft tea tourniquet, came out with some new stuff here recently, and they have a Hemcon. It's called the Elias Modular Bandage here. And this thing vacuum seals down like this, super tight. And this is a brand new product. You guys are literally seeing something that just released like a week ago. So, congrats. Uh, this is a really cool product, and it's going to be new in our kit work. It's we're changing over from a couple of things. What makes this new and different is you see how that just doesn't fall down and roll out all over the place. Okay, every I think it's like nine inches. There's a piece of Velcro. Hmm. See that? Huh. Well, that's kind of a big deal when you're dealing uh, in you know tactical or yeah. in the wilderness because keep things what? sanitary. Right. As soon as yeah, I drop it, smart. it it's gonna keep rolling all over the place and get this thing all dirty. The other thing that's really neat about these is. It has a compression bandage, right? But in here, it's got a gauze that has a coagulant and it's um, chido, it's chido gauze. And this you would take and you would pack this into a wound. Then once you get it packed in, it has this little bitty cup here. And you can't really see the cup. That looks like a, you know, it's kind of hard to see. Can you see oh that? yeah, we can see it. Yeah, yeah. we see it, yeah. Okay. Like that is a pressure cup. And what that does is allows you to apply pressure to the wound cavity. Huh. A lot of people are like, oh, you could use it as an eye cup. Well, that's not really why they designed it. So uh, humorous piece, but, and they even tell you, hey, it's not really that. Um, I've seen some people suggest it, but I'm not sure that I would, especially when the manufacturer says no. Um, but it, once you get it all the way wrapped around the wound, uh, you know, you're going to be able to use that as pressure against that wound. So this is going to be a new a new piece in our trauma kit. We also throw in um, uh, hemostat con, and then we also have emergency blankets, compression gauze, and the you know a lot of people are like, why are you throwing this little bitty package? This right here, it's an emergency blanket. And why do you think you'd want an emergency blanket if you've had trauma? So just before Shock. we go in. Yeah, shock, but exactly. for the audio listeners, I mean, oh, sorry. what is that, like three by four, three by maybe? four and maybe half an inch wide? Yeah, I mean. So the palm of your hand is about four inches, right? So, yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, it's about three by four. It's so like a it's cigarette about, pack size, but not in, not in, yeah, yeah not in actual it's Smaller than depth. the thickness of the finger. So, a lot of people aren't packing these things in, you know, yeah. and that's, you're going to yeah. keep. You're going to get shock, keep shock controlled if you do that. And this is the brand new tourniquet from Soft Tea. And um, this tourniquet has been redesigned. We lo I love this tourniquet because it is a metal windlass. So it's not plastic. It's not going to break. This thing is literally a piece of metal that is, I could pry on this thing. It's insane. It has two little uh, triangular buckles. And so or one triangular, the old original one had two triangular bank buckles, apologies. I still used to saying two triangular buckles. It's just got one now, but it also has this little side clip, which you can kind of see mm -hmm. right here, yep. right? It is set there, right? They redesigned the material of the actual uh, tourniquet here so that it slides better when you're applying one-handed, okay? okay. And the awesome part about this tourniquet too is it now has a slap indicator. You see that nice little red triangle? Yeah. Okay? When you actually get this taut enough before you go went spinning that windlass, you see how that thing disappeared? Right. It's now tight enough that I can actually start to spin the windlass and apply it and pull pressure into the, the tourniquet to allow it to begin to... Um, so it, um, it's a piece of basically red thread that once it sits in that's when you know, okay, it's now tight enough. We should start twisting this because now, because that twist isn't going to take up a lot of slack. Yeah, because I mean, if I leave this out, I could sit here and twist for a long time, right? Yeah, we don't want to twist for a long time. We're in a No, no, well, situation. the other part is you're not going to end up getting it tight enough either. So yeah. you really want to be able to make sure that's tight enough. 
The other thing that's kind of nice about these that the Cat 9 doesn't have, and you guys are like, I don't know anything about these tourniquets. I don't. But, <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> and so that your listeners are like, what is the big deal about these things? But this right here, if you notice, I can literally take this into this off. And yeah. Clip it. If you have a trapped limb, let's just, you know, uh, remember that, uh, what was that movie where the guy got trapped in the rock? 127 hours. hours. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Based on the book, 127 hours, based yeah, on the guy's I mean, experience of 127 yeah. hours trapped. Yeah. I'm like looking for my, oh, my Swiss Army knife's over there on the other table. Sorry. Instead of using this little knife to get my arm cut off, right, without trying to apply a tourniquet, I could actually apply this tourniquet now around my arm that's trapped because if it's a loop you can't do that right when it's trapped and right still yeah in. we'll do, be able to do this i can do this one armed right i can literally take this thing run over here hook it on apply it and once i've hooked it now i can actually cinch it down right right yeah if i have to the other ones you have to actually thread through okay you, you see the difference yeah you absolutely see all little pieces that make a huge deal and so you're like well this makes this is not exciting today. we talk about cars but, it's, uh, no, no, no. It it's exciting in that like, if you're in this situation, you want to know that you have this stuff nearby. Right. Yes. So, maybe you don't need it ninety percent of the time, but that ten percent is a big no, deal. Not ten percent. The perfect situation is one in which you never need this. And Correct. I mean, I'm speaking on Aaron's behalf here, obviously, <laughs> but like, the reality is nobody wants to be in a situation where any of this stuff is needed. But it's kind of like you just said something to the effect of what is it? The ninety percent of times you don't need it, or ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, better to have it not need it than need it and not have it. Right, ninety nine percent of the time we don't four wheel drive and we don't need a rooftop tent to travel exactly in and go camping in the backcountry, but mm -hmm. we still do it, right? Because it does provide us a little opportunity to get ourselves unstuck and a few other things. So something I talked about too that we provide is these chest seals. So what you can, if the viewers can't see it and we're listening, again, it's about seven inches tall. It's about four inches wide and it's literally super thin. It's half the, I mean, it's not even a third of the finger width, right? But what this does is the way your lung works and this is basically a lung, okay? <laughs> this is where the audio listeners should go to the video. <laughs> exactly. So what I have right here is actually a nice Rubbermaid uh, box that has a bladder in it for an um, blood pressure cup, and it's been turned into a, a lung, okay? So when I breathe, uh, the viewers can't see it, but this little <laughs> box is actually filling up, right? Yeah. Okay, so every Bag time- is I'm inflating. And it's deflating, right? Now, if you somehow puncture your chest, Say you fell on a stick, your buddy shoots you. <laughs> your buddy shoots you. <laughs> Hope, yeah, I'm laughing, quickly. but we live in America. That's a real reality. Yeah, and that's just hey, a Dick Tuesday. Cheney, Dick Cheney shot someone in the face. So exactly. So now you have a hole in your chest, okay, for whatever reason. And if you can see, this is no longer inflating. Okay? At all. At all. So what happens is you take these chest seals and you put it over the chest and what allows is you to repressurize your chest cavity and then your your lung will actually reinflate and uh that's really important if you don't like having painful breathing so it's, as you can as you guys can see and those watching this is now reinflated back to its original size after about five breaths and now we're back to full breathing so, so those are kind of important all right I, i've got actual like uh, I don't know, tac uh, the tactical is not the right term, but like just applying the chest seal allow, as long as the lung is undamaged would also allow it to reinflate. Yes. So when you puncture your chest, there is pressurization that happens, right? Right. When you take that ability for that to not be there, you actually get a collapsed lung, right? Or right. you end up uh, no ability for it to actually pressurize. And so by sealing it back up, you, you, you put back what was originally there. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> you plug the hole and you allow it to continue to work. And right. So, and, and also like, yeah. Okay. I like it. <laughs> I'm trying to dumb it down. Best I, can, I think Dude, my, my lifeguard boy scout 
first aid trainings are, trying, <laughs> are working really hard right now. Like, yeah. <laughs> so that that's the product that we're adding. And then with our first aid kits, you know, a lot of people like buy these huge blowout kits that are backpacks and stuff like that. We, I didn't even grab one, but they're literally almost the same size as our truck kits. They sit right. in your vehicle because honestly you don't need them all the time. It's, it's kind of the, Oh, my kid cut their finger. I cut my finger. Uh, I need a band aid. I need a little bit of gauze. Right. I need an ice pack. Um, you don't need a backpack full of first aid gear. I really don't believe that to be necessary, especially, you know, coming from the backpacking world, you only need so much and you can only carry so much. Your vehicle has a payload capacity. And I think you guys understand that, that the truck is only allowed to carry so much weight. Yeah. And we get very close, True. if not overload them all the time in the overlanding groups. Uh, they become heavily over overloaded. <laughs> and it's kind of a joke that overlanding is really just overloaded. And I think that it's true that we just continue to add more stuff to the vehicle before the vehicle, you know, you really should have stepped up to the next size vehicle. You know, we talked about the mid-size trucks and all this stuff. Talk about the towing fast that's suburban. Uh, you know, my Tacoma is getting very close to being outside of its rated amount that it's all really should be holding. I mean, that becomes down to braking and right. all these other, you know. What so, do you think your Tacoma weighs? I know exactly. Ways. oh shit really yeah, uh, okay 100 pounds um how much 5700 pounds um uh, and it's slightly okay over when i when i'm traveling i know that i'm over by 230 pounds um i know that because i go to a cat scale every time i travel out of town nice so, and that's just because uh i worked in accident reconstruction and mm -hmm. so for three years all i did was investigate serious vehicle accidents so i have i have a pretty good understanding about how vehicles stop yeah. and the friction, yeah. friction and how that all works and uh what it takes for you to uh, observe orient decide and act on an accident you know you have about a second and a half of mm -hmm. observation during the daytime and then you have a two and a half second at night so mm -hmm. then you add their feet per second right how fast you're traveling and what your, your your ability to stop and slow down well you then how long did it take to get there well you could traveled four to 500 feet before you did anything right so i mean a lot of people don't think about that uh, then when you add weight to a vehicle it, it prolongs how how quickly you can stop uh you right. know you're just pushing all that mass <clears throat> longer and so these are some of the things of why i got into teaching some of this stuff i mean it kind of feels like i'm all over the board safety wise but it all plays to the same thing we want to think more critically about what we're doing and then have the means to do it uh, uh safely one last product I want to talk about is on the medical side, because this is brand new too. Uh, you guys are literally looking at something that just came out three weeks ago. Nice. On a rise. Um, it's made here in Kansas City. So, Chris, this is kind of cool to, uh, for you to hear. Uh, this is made uh, for tactical medical solutions by a company called Alpha Point. And uh, Alpha Point is a nonprofit that employs the blind. And they actually make this product. And what's cool about this product is this is a kind of a plastic accordion uh, for the listeners. And it's got a hold out piece. Yeah, it collapses down to something that's yeah, like piece of paper size. You get to these corners and you can snap them in. It's got buttons. And once you snap these in, see it's got that hole yeah. that the other button piece folds into and clips into and you're like, what are you getting ready to make? What's awesome about this is I'm so curious. A Sam splint before. Say that again. You know, you know what a Sam splint is, Ross? I don't. A Sam splint is a malleable aluminum brace that you can make for someone to have if they need to make a splint. Dude, you just made oh, a shit. Boot. Holy shit, made it, buddy! Out of this. Wow. Piece of, and then if you need it to be for an arm splint. I literally just folded it down. What material is that? So there's a company that, that was called like Sked. Uh, they made these uh, kind of sleds for people for like tackle operations. And it's, it's just a plastic. It, it's some kind of, I don't even know what kind of plastic it is, but it's, it's the same stuff. I mean, literally, if you look up Sked, S-K-E-D-D, it was this uh, ability to move injured people and you would drag it with a rope and you'd put the casualty on the sked and they'd mm. pull along. 
Yeah, I literally feel like someone saw that and was like, I think we can make this smaller if, <laughs> if we can pack it down and right. we can make, we can mold it. Uh, and it really allows us to reduce the size and weight of a splint in our kits now. And that's going to be coming out here in about two weeks to our store. So that's going to be exciting. Wow. Um, all new okay. stuff. So that's exciting. Given I have very limited knowledge of this kind of stuff, but if you had told me that's what that was going to turn into, I wouldn't have believed it. That was pretty fucking cool. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So that's, it's kind of reminds okay. me of, does, does that make sense, Ross? I mean, that's kind of what. 100%. I, yep. Like a, like a, like like a polycarbonate effect. kind of. Yeah. yeah. Polycarbonate's so what came to mind, but I didn't, I don't know, yeah. speak out of touch. I don't know if that's really the material. <laughs> sounds really cool though so <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know like we started down the medical route and then someone was like hey and this was literally six months into that and then someone was like hey what recovery gear uh, we we're talking about recovery and we're teaching some people about recoveries and doing uh off-road recoveries not like recovery as far as drug and alcohol but uh you know we were <laughs> We were talking about how to get vehicles out and we we're talking about, you know, weight ratings and how to make sure your, your equipment is, you know, adequately the size for your vehicle. And someone was like, well, what do you buy? And I'm like, there's just so much out there. And there's, there's a little bit of me that is really trying to continue to help the American worker. If you notice most, almost everything I've shown you so far has been made in Missouri and been made in the United States. Yep. Uh, I happened upon a guy and uh, at, a, at an event and he said, Hey, would you want to sell your own recovery gear? And I thought, why the heck would I want to do that? You know, <laughs> but there's, they're all a dime a dozen. Right. And he said, no, look, here's the deal. You can, we'll make them, make them for you. And they're made in Texas. They're not assembled in Texas. It's, it's made in Texas. And, um, We'll put the ratings on there where you want them. We'll put your logo. Sorry, it's kind of hard to see the cameras. Yeah, I can see it. Pull them up on the website. And um, so we got soft shackles now. We can make them in any size. Nice. You want. We got tree savers, kinetic ropes like these. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if a customer calls and says, hey, I prefer people to call me. <laughs> I know that sounds... <laughs> But it sounds I, old school, but it's so much more like interpersonal than an email. It's a, it is a personal thing for me because I hate people buying things. I've taught two schools uh, where people had bought stuff, and I finally started putting a disclosure on my schools. I said, don't buy anything before you come. I would prefer you to actually understand the products. Why? I don't care if you don't buy mine. You know, go buy Factor 55. Go buy Mass Tracks. Go buy somebody. <laughs> buy a reputable company. But by the side, I mean, uh, you know, asymmetric ropes and all these other groups, I mean, they make good stuff. But understand uh, why you're buying it. But understand what you're buying, the ratings you need, and what you plan to do with it. Because, um, you know, I just hate seeing people waste money. You know, and that's one of my biggest pet peeves. I don't care if you spend good money on a product, but what I want you to do is spend the good money on products you can use. Mm -hmm. yeah. And about two classes, I finally said, don't buy anything. You don't even have to buy mine. Just, just wait. Up. I will let you use my stuff. And then when you're done, you know, go buy somebody else's, whatever you want, but at least you know the right stuff to buy. And so that's why I got into recovery ropes and, mm -hmm. and recovery equipment. And then, uh, you know, it's weird because it just kept perpetuating itself. Uh, we sell element fire extinguishers now, uh, which are from Italy. Dude, I, uh, I love their Instagram account. It's hilarious. I mean, yeah. I don't know if hilarious is the right phrase because like, it's just a, it, it's a stick. How do you spell it? It, a stick. it looks Element. like road flare. Element? Yeah. -E Give me a second, Ross. I'll have it up. There you go. L-E-M-E-N-T. And it looks like a road flare, Ross. It literally is, I should have brought one down. It's, I think it's it, Element Fire on Instagram, Ross. Nope, that's yeah. not it. That might find you Official somewhere. Element you Fire official element fire oh it looks like yeah it literally looks like a road flare yeah so you what you end up doing is you take the cap off on one end it exposes the striking force you unscrew the bottom and then you strike yeah there you go the instructions just telling you exactly <laughs> what you i think you're gonna step point one the open road flare one, step two. <laughs> and it's going to discharge at the fire for either 50 seconds or 100 seconds 
Yeah, and based on the size. It, yes, and so literally, look at this. These things work so well on vehicle fires. They are rated for all fire types, but in the United States, they can't get the underwriter's uh, licensing to test it accordingly because it's not. they've written the rules for normal fire extinguishers with a gauge and they're uh, liquid-based. So they're kind of nicely tested. And so it kind of sucks because they're really great product. I put out two fires with these things uh, and they work so well. So you can or can't buy them in the US? You can. You can, yeah. okay. You can, um, can but- use them for auto. Yeah. Uh, but they're not rated for anything else. Like I couldn't go throw the thing into a business instead of having a fire extinguisher. They're not gonna be officially rated for Oh that. no, but for- the- off-road use like Just, that's kind, that it's like the size of a huge mag light well and like yeah they're also like where the regular fire extinguishers expire over time mm-hmm. these last much longer right yeah they don't expire from what i can tell yeah. <laughs> but we'll see how that works i'd like to try one out in five or six years i tried to date one and leave it alone um you know the best part about it is it's smaller in size it runs longer than a normal you'll you will run this longer than you will one of those fire extinguishers. And I think that's, uh, which type is that one? That one on the left, does it say what it kind it is? It says E50. Uh, the, the actual fire extinguisher, though. Oh. Is- I may pick one of these up because in, you know, with the ATVs and side-by-sides, yeah, like you have storage space, but, limited. you know, it's very limited. Um, that's actually it's also non-corrosive. The best part about it is these guys that have these really fancy cars, Lamborghinis, uh, you know, Ferraris, it, they're worried about what it's going to do if they have to use it and it will not damage the vehicle. The propellant and all that stuff that's in it is non-corrosive. So it's, it's cheaper than, I think it's called Halcyon or whatever it is, fire extinguishers, um, some others that are out there. So, and I think Halcyon are actually kind of corrosive if I remember right, but there's some really expensive fire extinguishers out there that uh, are supposed to help, but I think this is a better option all around. Very interesting. I'm Didn't trying to exist. I'm trying to find the video of one in action, but that's always their Instagram account is just literally examples of other fire extinguishers not working. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. You can take uh, all the different types of fires that you can have yourself exposed to: paper, wood, uh, oil metal, electrical, and this will put them all out. Instead of having to grab a special fire extinguisher or an ABC, this is going to put them all out and it does it so well. It's just impressive, Ross. I mean, look at the couple of good videos. Yeah, on no, I, I, I believe it. I love their, they've got a magnet one. So it's just like, or they've got a magnet holder. So it's just like on the side of the refrigerator. So like, it's just in the kitchen. Like it's just, just the case. Like I have yeah, two on top for, of the refrigerator right now. I'm literally the only one in the house who can reach them. Yeah, I tell you, I, I love Step them. Stool. It, it had a propane. So, you know, the uh, propane water heaters for like camping and stuff, the ones that uh, run the water through it and it's got like yeah. a piece. Yeah. Okay. So, our last trip, we had one that was a little older and I don't know what was going on with it. I'm not going to name the brand, um, but it, uh, excuse me, it flared, it wouldn't ignite. And so the propane's rolling through it, right? And then finally, it just decided to kick off. And when it did, it all caught it, the whole thing in gold. Well, it's like, it's 13, it's probably 15 inches from my brand new Opus trailer. And I had just literally told my wife, I'm like, hey, you know, there's the fire extinguishers in the Opus, but this element is inside the kitchen. So if there's ever a fire, I prefer to use this because I think it's better anyway. So literally I said, hey, the, the propane heater's on, on fire. She oh, ran and got. I had it put out in less than two or three seconds. She tried to record it. Funny enough, I was later. I'm like, did you record that? And she's like, yes, I recorded it. And I had it out before she could really get her phone out. So <laughs> the thing, we're talking flames like this high. I mean, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. I, I nearly burnt my eyebrows off by the thing. It was just crazy. So, I mean, it's uh, they work so well. I mean, it's just really impressive. But. So before we wrap things up, just because I'm, I'm crunching on time. He's super what late. do you have? <laughs> what? You're so late. Uh, yeah, I, I I have a lot of things I need to do. Uh, what do you have? What's your personal kit aside from like the Tacoma and the build and the mods and all that? What's in your own must-have 
arsenal of things for somebody going into the woods. So are we, are we talking, um, I think it's so dependent and I, I always hesitant to ever give an answer like that, but if we're talking in general, <laughs> let's, uh, two nighter, let's solo. go two nighter, two nighter. Are we traveling solo or with a group? I'm going to say with a group, but under the assumption that nobody else in the group has knowledge or tools to do what you probably can. Okay. So at the end of the day, usually what I try to do is, uh, if I'm traveling a group, I usually will take a medical questionnaire and I will send it out to whoever is the team. <laughs> Holy shit, really? <laughs> yeah. So I have a questionnaire that I send to my friends when we get ready to leave. Who has allergies? Who has medical con- conditions? And then who do I need to contact if something terrible is going on? Allergies is a fantastic thing to ask people about. That is something that actually doesn't come up enough. And I'm glad that you pointed it out. My brother, who I regularly ventured deep into the woods with has severe, severe, severe food allergies. Mm. So I do appreciate that is something that you are considering. Yeah. I mean, and it's just, I think it's important because uh, the, a family may know that little Johnny has this condition, right? Has a protein allergy or something. I mean, something that's obscure. Mm-hmm. We may not ever talk about that. We may be friends, but it's not something that I need to pry into their life about or know they press into mine. But when we go into the woods uh, or we go into the wilderness and we're relying on what we take with us, it's very important for us to lay it all on the table and say, how can I benefit you if something was to go terribly wrong? What is What precludes you from being 100%? You know, here's what it takes for me to not be 100%, you know? Um, I disclose my same medical conditions and we pass these things around. I, I mean, I'm a fairly healthy guy, but I can't take Vicodin, uh, you know, like that causes me to go crazy. So don't give me Vicodin. Um, you know, it's just one of those things. And I think it's fair for people. And the first time it happened, when the first time I did a trip like that, and someone was like, what are we doing here? I'm like, well, this is so you can get me home safely if something terrible happens, you know. Um, so the, other the thing, worst hope for the best. That's right. The other thing I've tried to encourage people to do is, you know, this typical stuff of plan your trip, you know, let someone know where you're going yeah. and let's responsible know where you're going. If I let, you know, I got a friend, if I told them where I'm going, they wouldn't know where I, they wouldn't even remember the conversation, you know, uh, <laughs> tell them where you're going is, is fine, but find someone, you know, that's responsible to tell them where you're going. I think that's still true, even in off-roading and stuff. Uh, just as in backpacking and then as far as gear and once we get down to that you know i make sure that i have enough food and water to go one day longer than i anticipate being um, especially if i'm going to be further in the back country mm-hmm. uh, the the other thing i make sure is that i have appropriate uh, trauma kits for however many people i have you know i take care of my vehicle because my kit is for me <laughs> now if it to a point of us having a serious injury, I will use my stuff on you, but I hope I have two or three more in the car, right? right. That's when I'm getting into something else, right? And then um, I make sure I have enough food or gas for travel and uh, make sure that then the next step comes into communications. And, um, you know, we have a very close relationship with Midland Radio. Uh, it being here in Kansas City, we get to test and evacuate a lot of radios for them. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming. I'm not going to talk about it, but I was it is. Literally talking to my dad about two hours ago about buying a GMRS Midland. Oh, good. Well, let me so, know. Decide. I'm trying to get him on the show. So. Oh, good. Oh, perfect. Because I literally, I like, so I have a regular CB, mm-hmm. but I'm. I have like a deadline and a trip plan that I need GMRS for. So sure. Well, let's get please you do get Midland on Chris. Yeah. Let me, let me get you taken care of. I just met with them today. So it's uh, we had lunch, the owner and the COO and their Perfect. director. So I know them very well and we talk regularly so we can try and work something out. I, I have, think oh, yeah. I have a feeling your contacts are better than my LinkedIn connections. So <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Well, I, let's uh, let's. I make reached it out to the other marketing people. I was like, "We have similar <laughs> resumes. Come on, my podcast." But no, that's not. But as far as like communication stuff, that's really dependent on where you are and who you're with. You know, mm-hmm. communicate a two way street. <laughs> yeah. If I'm talking, if you can't hear what I'm saying, it doesn't really matter. So if you're on CB and I'm running GMRS, it really does me no good. 
And then how am I going to communicate if there's an emergency? You know, everyone's like, oh, I'll just get a ham radio and I'll figure it out. Well, there's a lot of people that bought a lot of bow things and they think if the world goes to crap, I'm going to pick that thing up and act like I know what I'm doing. Right. And the problem is if you're not using a ham radio regularly or an amateur radio, it's, it's not just pick it up and use it. Uh, there's a lot of nuances to understanding frequencies and codes and how that all works. And mm -hmm. you want to use a repeater or how does that work? You know, I'm a ham operator, you know, because I want to understand the technology, you know, th those are the things for me that I want to continue to grow and learn in. Mm -hmm. And so I wake up every day and I drive to work in my fleet Tacoma and I get on the radio and I talk to 90 year old guys that are like, you know, the weather's terrible today, you know, but you know what, what I'm doing is I'm per perfecting a, 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 a skill yeah. and I'm yep. how to use equipment more effectively every day. Um, and so I usually tell people communication wise, you need to find out what everyone's using and then understand how you're going to communicate in an emergency. You know, CB for us mm -hmm. is not a technology still. If you're in the Northwest or you're in logging country, that's how they communicate is by CB. Yeah, I would like to know yep. if you 18 wheeler with a bunch of, you know, uh, logs are coming down the road that could kill me. And that's an important thing, you know, GRMS anything right so if no one's listening you, it doesn't do any good and so i always encourage people to figure out what the best communication device is for you they all have their limitations satellite and everything else so uh, and then after that i usually encourage everyone to figure out what is your load ratings for all your vehicles and your recovery gear <laughs> and then make sure that they're all you know the appropriate rated for what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have different type of vehicles you know four runner and tacoma running around together you can use basically the same stuff jk if you got someone that's the wild one in the bunch, just got an F-350 that thinks they need to roll with you through the, you know, small tight woods of Ohio, or, or Arkansas or something like that, you're going to need some different recovery gear because what I've got is not rated for that level of a vehicle. And that, so that makes those me are think, are pretty, oh, right? That makes me think as I just put the toe strap that I've had since my 04 TJ Wrangler into the back of the Suburban. Yeah. Might I'm be pretty time to sure it it's was. time that I need to look at some yep. ratings on those. For oh, yeah, reference, yeah. we have uh, we have this like yellow toe strap with metal hooks on the end that my dad used to use in his '89 YJ that mm. has now been like relegated to side by side use. Yeah. So <laughs> I've got one of those as a training that says if you have something like yeah. this. For so. throw it away yeah exactly That's, yeah it's no it's away. it's it's literally like after a certain time or age divide the rating by five you know and, yeah. and metal end yeah you know i before we get away from that i do i would like to say <laughs> Ross, there's just so much to talk about i know metal, you know here's the reality metal shackles yeah metal shackles a lot of people are like why would you use these things there's a place for these and there's a place for these, you know, it's soft awesome. set, hard shackles have a place. You know, I can't only use these where there's appropriate radius. You got to have the same radius as the mm -hmm. thickness of the rope, right? Well, if it's sharp edges, I can't use this. And how many bumpers do you know that it's a 90 on the hook or the loop? Where if I use this, this is four and three quarters ton. I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't side load this, these are really hard to destroy. I mean, if you want to look at some really interesting stuff, Factor 55 does a lot of really great testing and videos. You can go watch them destroy these stuff, this stuff. You know, these are made uh, by Van Beach, and they're made, I believe, in Holland. You want to go watch them make some stuff for huge shipping operations. They got some as big as your truck they make. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are insanely effective. And I, I know people are, you know, what I encourage everyone to get into is closed winching and recovery systems, which means no open hooks. Yeah. If you can get away from open hook, you're in a better position than we were 15 years ago. Although I do like these and these do work well, there's there's a time and a place for these as much as there is for these. And that's my word on those. But uh, <laughs> I didn't get away from that when we talked about metal. So I don't know. It's all right. Ross is going to turn into a pumpkin eventually. So it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, Aaron, it's at switchback underscore outdoor underscore safety on Instagram. And that also gets its switch back outdoor safety on Facebook. I believe so. Yes. And then yeah. you're, you're your own man on Instagram too. It's just Aaron Paris, right? Yes. 
yeah, if you would, please uh, like uh, switch back on uh, Instagram is I've got uh, now we're over a thousand on Facebook, thankfully, which is great. Thank you for everyone that has continued to like on the content. Uh, we would like you to try and follow us also on Instagram so you can get parted, parted twice by the same post. Uh, I know that doesn't seem like a big deal, but as uh, you were saying earlier, it's nice when your your algorithms say that you're at least reaching people. So right. <laughs> You appreciate everyone that's uh, followed us and, and liked this over the last couple of years and continue to perpetuate it as we get bigger. Uh, there's a lot of really great stuff coming up in the next month. There's a lot of stuff coming up in the next six months. And uh, there's, we're just really grateful for the support. So you just drop stuff tonight. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, stuff yeah, tonight. seriously. Yeah. So Dude, that splint thing was wicked. Uh, yeah, that's wild. Anyway, I'll wrap up the show. You can rate and review the show. Uh, we, we still say iTunes anywhere, anywhere that you can find the podcast. All Give the us places. a review. Uh, we are on YouTube. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. Um, and then you can read Ross did a spring update to the Forerunner. I actually saw it on the site today. I wrote um, two things in one week for the first woo! time in a long time. That's all right. I post one post a week. Sorry, Jeff. Um, it's the podcast. <laughs> It's, Jeff will be yeah teaser Jeff's coming back soon Jeff's coming back uh I think like two more weeks mm -hmm. maybe more um Ross is at no not like the one from friends I'm at overlanding dad and we made it we made it to the end Ross is still with us I see the end yep <laughs>